You're listening to This Is My Side Hustle, the tips, tools, and advice you need to optimize your life live here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to additional income by engineering your choices around your ideal lifestyle, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join us as we unpack unconventional ideas and methods to give you more freedom and flexibility. Let's escape the rat race together and live with intention. Let's learn how others are making it pay with their side hustles. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 10 of This Is My Side Hustle. Today, I'm going to be walking you through my entire process when I onboard a new client. And I was going to do a different topic today, but I happened to be onboarding a new client and I thought, wow, I think a lot of people would benefit from this because I've kind of gotten it down to this really smooth system. And systems are kind of my favorite thing to do in my own business and on my, in well, inside of my client's business if, if they need it. I like to set systems up and just make everything run as smooth as possible and automate as many things as possible. It just saves time. Um, once you get it set up, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I'm going to be speaking about this tomorrow. Uh, I'm actually recording this on May 6th. Tomorrow, May 7th, I am doing a 30-minute presentation on how to systematize your business for the International Virtual Assistance Association. And if you are a member of that association, and I will put a link in the show notes in case you're not and you're interested, you'll get access to not only my webinar, but uh, monthly webinars, uh, different kinds of resources, discounts for virtual assistants, and you get access to their request for proposal pages, um, which is basically a way for prospective clients to send requests for proposals for virtual assistants that they need. Um, it's about $150 a year. Yeah, it might be a little less or a little more, but it's right around that point, $150 US dollars. Uh, but you don't have to be in the US to apply because it is international. And I, when I applied, I more than recouped my money tenfold within two weeks by getting a client through them. So I definitely highly recommend them. It's not foolproof. I have seen here and there a few uh, random scammy looking people asking for proposals, but those are pretty few and far between. It's definitely better than things like Upwork and Freelancer. Um, Even LinkedIn is kind of wrought with people trying to run scams. So you have to be very careful about that. But otherwise I definitely recommend it because you get all kinds of training included and just, it's a wonderful resource. So Since this systems stuff was fresh on my brain and since I just onboarded a new client, which, speaking of which, if you listen to episode six where I talk about if you should be a work-from-home employee or a business owner and which is best for you, I discuss a little of my personal decision to turn down an employee position uh, because I felt like it was going to be too much of a time suck on me and... I I only have, you know, five hours a week or so to work with, so I could fit in a new client, but I really didn't want to take on a full-time position working for someone else. And I think my instincts were right because shortly thereafter, one of my current clients introduced me via email to her uh a longtime friend of hers, uh, someone who was a pastor at her church. She knew him a long time, and he's running several different businesses, just like I am. Uh, He's all over the place. (laughs) He's written books. He does discipleship programs for people. Um, He just has a lot going on. He's involved in many different things, and I guess he was talking to her about everything going on and how stressed he is, and he can't get everything together in his business. And she very graciously recommended me um, and introduced us via email. And I took a look and I decided, hey, this is more 
in line with my values, my current time. Uh, it will still give, give me an opportunity to make a difference in the world, but also determine my own hours and when I work and yeah, and, and I'll be making a difference. I, it's a, it's a great organization. I'm really excited about it. But since I just went through this morning, the onboarding process, I just wanted to share a little bit about what I do and how I do that, because I know a lot of virtual assistants get really nervous and uh, lack confidence when having a new client call. And I feel like if you can go through this process and I can share with you some, some things that have been helpful for me and even share the exact things I do and the exact questions I asked that it will you know, it will help you out in some way. So what I do first, uh, when she first introduced me to him, so whether you're reaching out to someone who's looking for a virtual assistant or someone comes to you via your website and you're responding to them, or if somebody introduces you via email, like in this situation, um, I first send them a link to my Acuity scheduling page. So I use Acuity scheduling. I have a link on my website, but I often just send them a link via email and they can pick the time that's best for them. And what I do with that is I, I only set my availability for times that I know I absolutely will be available and I most likely will not be disturbed because I like to set up video calls with my clients or my Perspective clients, I guess I should call, I should say, um, so that I can see their facial expressions, uh, just kind of meet them more personally rather than just on the phone or just via email. I feel like you can uh, learn a lot from someone and get better information and build a little bit of a, a rapport with them when you're able to see them face to face, at least virtually. So I send them to my acuity scheduling page, and then after that. Uh, I send them an email with a link to questions, and it's called a new client assessment form. Now, I will put a link in the show notes for that. If you go to makingitpaytostay.com slash onboard, that's O-N-B-O-A-R-D, you can take my exact questions. Now, I literally linked to the client assessment form that I use, but don't fill it out because then I will be getting all of your answers. Just use it to build your own Google forms. So I use G Suite and I'll also put a link in the show notes to that because if you go through my link, you'll get a 14 day free trial. Um, And if you shoot me an email or leave me a voicemail, I can even give you a 20% discount on that. So if you're interested, let me know because I use G Suite for pretty much all of my client needs. And it's great to have a Google form all ready to go and you just send them the link and then they go and they fill it out. And then you've got all of their information that they filled out stored in there and ready to go for your call. So another thing I wanted to mention when they, when you're setting up your acuity, uh, blah, 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 acuity scheduling page, or you can use other schedulers. It really doesn't matter. I just really like acuity. Um, when you're setting it up, Make sure that you choose an option that does not give them the option to con or to set up a meeting with you within 24 hours. So the soonest someone can set up a uh, meeting with me when I send them that link is 24 hours from when they get the link because I don't want someone scheduling something to meet with me in two hours and then I have zero time to prepare because while I'm waiting for our first discovery call, I'm researching them and I'm gathering all the information I can about that person. And then when they get the link to fill out, it asks them even more questions. And it just helps me be more prepared and more confident and more aware of how I can help them, perhaps where they're lacking, what they're struggling with. It just gives me a better picture of how I can then pitch services to them and perhaps even how long it's going to take me every month and what specific services I'm going to be doing, which also then helps me create a proposal. So after I send them the email with the link to the questions on the new client assessment form, 
I then send them a Zoom meeting link for the time they chose. So when they chose a time to meet with me on Acuity Scheduling, I then go to, I use Zoom for all of my uh, video calls. And I even use Zoom for recording my podcast. Um, I use it for sending to podcast guests. And I also use it just for recording my podcast. I just feel like everything in one place. Why use multiple tools? It's all great. Uh, I can do video or no video. I can do audio. Um, I can not let them join the meeting before I'm there so I can get it set up and prepared. So I just really like it. It also has chat features. And if you get a paid subscription to Zoom, there's all kinds of bells and whistles you can do, like fake backdrops behind you. And it's really cool. So definitely check that out. I'll put a link in the show notes to Zoom as well. And so then let's just do a quick rundown of what we've done so far. We sent them a link to the Acuity scheduling page. We send them an email with links to the new client assessment form. Then we send them a Zoom meeting link. Then I spend as much time as I can getting prepared by researching what they do and uh, going over all the questions they've asked so that I'm ready. And if there's anything they didn't answer on the form or if there's still information I really know that I want to go over with them, I write it down on a little list so that I have it in front of me when we're talking. The next thing I do is I get on the call with them. Then The call usually takes around 20 to 40 minutes Um, because we've both done so much preparation in advance. They've spent time thinking about how to answer the questions I've sent. I've spent time researching everything they've sent me um, and anything else I can find. Then it doesn't really take that long. So what I tell them at the end of the call is, okay, well, it sounds like, you know, this would be a good fit. Let me... um, kind of make sense and gather all this information, parse it out a little bit and uh, get you a proposal shortly. And I usually tell them that I will send them a proposal the next day. Most of the time I do it right away though, because everything's fresh in my mind and I like to be on top of it and it's fresh in their mind too. So if you do that and they're kind of excited when they're on the call with you, they have a, a, less likely chance of talking themselves out of it (laughs) because they just talk to you and you were on the ball and you were prepared and you were confident. So if you send them a a proposal fairly quickly and you've got everything systematized and laid out, so it shouldn't take you that long, then I feel like there's a more likely chance of them being like, okay, yeah, this ball is rolling. Let's keep going. You've gained momentum with them. And it it just moves things along quickly. The next thing I do is send them a thank you email with a proposal. So I go over what they talked about with me, what I talked about, what we decided on, you know, as far as starting times and hours, Uh, And what I mean by that is a date when they'd like to get started and how many hours they'd like to do for a retainer the first month or what package is best for them. So it really depends on the client. Um, I do many different packages and retainers for different kinds of clients. And I always have that in mind. The one I sent today, because he has so many different things going on and he's creating online courses and social media and he needs Uh, like book proposals and editing and fundraising for his nonprofit and just all kinds of things like that. It just wouldn't make sense for me to make a package of that. So I went with a retainer package. Um, So rather than saying I will do these specific tasks every single month, I decided it would be best to do a retainer package with him. And when I'm just starting out with someone I generally suggest doing a 10 hour retainer package for one month because it takes you probably five hours just to get them all like up to speed, onboarded. Everyone knows what's going on. And then another five hours to like really start digging into everything and setting up systems. So I like to do that at the beginning. And then I gave him two other retainer package prices 
for a 15 hour and a 20. And I said, let's do 10 the first month. You can always increase it if need be, but there's no point in you paying for more time than it's going to take the first month. And there's always a bit of a learning curve. And a lot of that first month is just getting to know each other, getting to feel each other out for how you both work. And also, like I said, setting up just basic systems. Okay, so after I send them that, if they do want to move forward, and I do say to them in the email, thank you so much, here's a proposal. If you'd like to move forward, here's what's going to happen next. And so I specifically tell them what they can expect so that they know, okay, well, now what? If I say, okay, then what? I don't want them guessing or having to, like, figure things out or try to ask an awkward question. I don't want to put them in that position. So I tell them very specifically what's going to happen next if they're good with that proposal. Um, So what I say and then what I do is I then invoice them via Square. And I like Square because it's I've had less problems with them than PayPal. Um, They charge the same as PayPal. So both PayPal and Square charge about a 3% fee. So you definitely need to take that into consideration when you're creating your packages and stuff um, because you need to add in a little bit of a buffer because of that. Now, when you go to do your taxes, uh, any kind of banking fees uh, from PayPal or Square or what have you are tax deductible, but just because they're tax deductible doesn't mean you're not paying them. So keep that in mind, but I use Square, and if you want to get your first $30 fee-free, mean or your, yeah, it's $30, your first $1,000 in payments that you get. So if you send your clients invoices via Square, you'll save $30, which is 3% of $1,000. Uh, then go to makingitpaytostay.com slash Square. If you use my link, you'll save on that. And hey, we can all use an extra 30 bucks, right? (laughs) Why pay fees if you don't have to? Um, So I send them the invoice. And then when and only when they actually pay. So I don't do anything else until they pay. My work is done. They can take it or leave it. Um, The reason I say like, don't do any work or don't do anything else until they pay is because some Heaven forbid, but it's ha- it's not happened to me, but it's happened to many, many other virtual assistants where their clients have stiffed them. So they just assume and, you know, hope for the best that the client will pay them and they get started right away and they put in five to 10 hours worth of work and their client still hasn't paid them. And then their client ghosts them and they never hear from them again. And here they've just done all this work totally for free. And if you don't have a contract signed and you're not paid, then you have no recourse. So do not do anything until you're paid. As soon as I get paid, I send them my W-9 for tax reporting purposes because I'm a 1099 person. And I also put my EIN number on there. Uh, I highly recommend even if you're a sole proprietor to get an EIN number um, just because you don't have to put your social security number on your W-9s. So I send them my W-9 form that's all filled out, and I send them a welcome packet and contract. And my welcome packet and contract is like 10 pages long. (laughs) But what the welcome packet has in it is basically what they can expect from me when I work, when I take off, if I have to go on vacation, what they can expect what charges I charge, if there are last minute urgent rush charges, uh, what my normal response time is. These are all very personal. So you can kind of decide these as you go. But um, my contract is as extensive as you possibly could have it. And it's not because I'm trying to be a jerk. And it's not trying because I'm trying to be like not transparent. I'm trying to be over transparent and like cover both of our butts. I also talk about uh, confidentiality. Uh, I do not do a non-disclosure agreement anymore unless they specifically ask me to, uh, because a lot of times when you have clients, you're working on a team with other people and you're also working with their clients. And unless they say, Hey, I don't want you telling anybody that you work with me, then I don't worry about that. Um, 
it's up to you if you want to do that or not. It's going to probably depend on that person and depend on the industry. If they ask you for one, you, you should probably be okay with it. Um, but I also like to not include that anymore because after six months of working with a client, I then ask them for a testimonial. So if I'm not going to disclose that, then I don't get a testimonial either. And I also like referring other people to my clients as well. So if I can't tell anybody that I'm working with them, then that just, it puts a lot of things on there that most people don't really care about. Most clients are not going to be like, I don't want anyone to know that you're working with me. But if they ask, then you can get a form like that online, uh, probably for free. In fact, if you just Google non-disclosure agreement template, I'm sure you can find one and just fill in the details and you can just add that on to your welcome packet and contract. Um, I do send them the W-9 via email, but I send the welcome packet with the contract included in a PDF form via hello sign. And that just lets them review it and then sign off. And it comes straight back to me. I sign it when I go to send it. And then we've got a signed contract. It's really quick. I don't have to print anything out or scan anything. Uh, they don't have to do that and fill anything out. It's all right there online. And then once that happens, then I set up a Trello board for them. And I absolutely love Trello. So if you haven't tried Trello, you've definitely got to check it out. Go to makingitpaytostay.com slash Trello, and I think you'll get some kind of a discount uh, if you go with a paid plan. And you'll want to go with a paid plan if you're using Trello now for sure. Their free plan used to have unlimited boards, but now they've limited it to – gosh, I should have checked before I got on here, but – I think it's only 10 boards at the most. And if you have multiple clients with multiple projects going on, you're going to want that. And it's really inexpensive. And if you go through my link, then you'll save money on that as well. But I go and set up a Trello board for them or a Trello team, I guess I just should say. I set up a team in Trello with them and me. And then I create various boards based on the different projects they have going on. Uh, which is something I ask for during my call with them. I basically ask them to do a brain dump of everything that they've got going on and if possible, separate it into categories um, because it makes it easier for me to then look at the different categories, what all they've got going on, and I can quickly make boards in Trello and then I invite them via Trello. And then the final thing I do before we actually start working and You'll probably need to do this too if you're working with a client that does anything online is I send them, I ask them to send me any kind of logins I'm going to need for anything via LastPass. Now, I love LastPass because you can share your login information, so your username and passwords for everything, but you don't actually have to share those specific usernames and passwords. So my client, I don't have my client's actual usernames and passwords, I unless they don't care. I mean, some people just don't care and they send it to me like that in a spreadsheet or something. That's fine, but I like to put it into LastPass anyway and then get rid of that spreadsheet because you just can't be too careful with people's information nowadays. I also use VPNs very often. Uh, I have virus scanners on all my devices. I'm very vigilant about that because I know I have a lot of people's information um, and I don't want that shared. So I get rid of that. So even if they don't send it to me via LastPass, I put it into LastPass and then I destroy the evidence that they sent me originally with all of the original things on it. That way I can then log into their social media accounts, their website, their auto or their email autoresponder, their CRM program, anything else that they might have that I will need access to before I actually start working. And then, you know, we're ready to go. So that's kind of how I onboard a client. Uh, after that, I like to touch base with them weekly. And when I have a client who I work with on a retainer package for a certain amount of hours, what I do is every Monday morning, I send all of my clients a 
report with just a summary um, of the time I spent on different tasks from the week before. And the tool I use to keep track of that is called Toggle. And I will link to that in the show notes. But I have inside of Toggle, every different client is a different color. And when I'm working on a specific task, I just put a brief description of the task. I start the timer. I go and do my stuff. And then I end it. And then every Monday morning before I start for the next week, I download the summary reports for each client and I send that to them. And then I kind of give them an update on where we are for retainer hours so that they know how many we've used, how many are left. And that's helpful also when you're billing monthly, because if it's getting towards the end of a, of a retainer period, whether it's the first of the month or the 15th of the month or whenever you start it, it's nice for them to know, okay, um, we're not going to get this done in this in this retainer period, or, oh, I've got some extra hours. Let's work on this project that I've, you know, been putting off because we have some time. Let's get it done in this month. So that's helpful for them. And, you know, I want people to make the best use of their time that they're paying me for. Just like I also like to be able to budget my time accordingly and leave enough room in there in case, you know, one client has a whole lot of hours left near the end of a month or, vice versa. Now I do find it easier to not start all clients on the first of the month. The reason for that is <laughs> because then the 26th of the month comes and everyone wants to hurry up and use up their retainer hours. And then the end of the month is always crunch time for me because I'm trying to manage a bunch of stuff that nobody paced out over the month. Um, so what I do is I like to start clients on different days, kind of staggered. It's also really helpful for cash flow purposes. Um, so, you know, I have a client, I have two clients that start on the first of the month. And then I have another client who's every other week. And then I have another client who's on, gets billed on the fifth. And then another client who gets billed mid month. And that just helps um, it might sound more confusing to do it that way, but I have recurring invoices set up in Square. Um, so I really don't have to think about it or worry about it. But it does help me with my time so that I'm never really working more than four hours a day at any point in the month. Because for one client, the end of the retainer period might be the beginning of someone else's. And I've found that a lot of times they tend to have a brand new retainer and so they're not in any hurry to use up the hours, but then at the end they are in a hurry to use them up. And so, like I said, everyone wants everything at the end, but that doesn't really pose a problem if you stagger them. So that's why I do it that way. It just makes my time management easier, if that makes sense. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I hope this helped. Like I said, go to um, the show notes. I will have everything I mentioned in this episode linked there. The show notes for this episode is makingitpaytostay.com slash 10. So the number 10. Um, so definitely go and check that out. And I'm hoping you can gain some value for this. I've got, you know, that free uh, you could just copy the questions for free from my own client assessment form. Um, and then if you sign up for that and you get that via your email, you'll also get an opportunity to purchase for $17, 17 more forms that I use inside of my virtual business that I've found to be very helpful. So it's a dollar a form. If you want that, feel free. If not, just ignore it. But you will have an opportunity to get that as well if you like the idea of just making things a little easier on yourself while running your own business. And you might even be able to use those for some of your clients as well, especially if your clients have their own clients or if they're uh, coaches or something like that, that will be helpful. Um, if you're a social media manager, these will also help you as well. Basically any kind of service provider that has clients of any kind, these forms and this kind of a system will probably make things run a lot smoother for you as well. And until next time, this is my side hustle. 
Thanks so much for listening. Please don't forget to rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, pretty much anywhere else you can find fine podcasts. And please share this with your friends. Let them know via word of mouth. Tell them on social media. Follow us on social media. And we'll talk to you next time. Thanks so much.